The Earth was once the center of the universe. It was flat. Then it was round. And it circled the sun. It was no longer the center of the universe. It was a tiny part of the Milky Way. The Milky Way was the only galaxy. Except it wasn't. It was only one of billions of galaxies floating in space without end. Every single time we think we've got it all figured out, we realize we've merely found another piece of the picture. It is a big picture. With many pieces. Sir Isaac Newton was the first to state the law of gravity. Eventually, everybody agreed that gravity alone formed galaxies and stars and planets, and that gravity alone holds the universe together. Then we discovered a force a thousand billion, 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 billion times more powerful than gravity. Until recently, we believed that the space between the stars and planets was empty, a vacuum. We now know it is teeming with charged particles. We see glowing electric filaments spanning millions of light years. We see stellar and galactic formations shaped by magnetic fields. Only electric currents create magnetic fields. It is possible that the predominant force in the universe is not gravity, but something else. Recent discoveries in space have amazed and perplexed astronomers. Current popular theories in the sciences can neither predict nor explain the phenomena we are now observing. A new theory is being proposed. A theory which can both predict and explain the data coming back from deep space. Its implications are profound and affect all the scientific disciplines. It is in fact a synthesis of the disciplines. A synthesis which has already led to discoveries that link modern astronomy, leading edge plasma physics and ancient mythology. The electric model offers us a new interpretation of the workings of the universe, the history of our solar system, and even human history.
The rise of science was a triumph over mythology, over magic and superstition. That's why the word science today implies reliability. The word myth means fiction, not true. And it turns out that the key to understanding the myths is the same key that is now helping us to understand objects in deep space. To understand the workings of the physical universe. That key is electricity. It was 33 years ago that I first began to wonder about these preposterous stories told around the world, what we call world mythology. What was it that provoked this incredible outpouring of human imagination just a few thousand years ago, just before the birth of the first civilizations? I came to a radical conclusion that the myths arose from extraordinary natural events. Our early ancestors witnessed things in the sky that are not seen today. The events were awe-inspiring, both beautiful and terrifying. So it shouldn't surprise us that the myths are so incomprehensible. Well, of course they're incomprehensible. The celestial references are no longer present. It was in 1994 that I was invited to come to the US to attend a conference which was dealing with the possibility that the ancient sky, as witnessed by our earliest forebears, was different to the one we see today. I'd been interested in this uh, kind of idea because uh, it could only be explained in terms of electromagnetic influences within the solar system. So it came as a bit of a shock and a surprise to see David Talbot showing slides at one of the uh, sessions at the conference, which I recognized immediately as being similar to those of electric discharges in the laboratory. It was wonderful for me personally to uh, come to my first Cronia meeting and hear Dave Talbot and I still want to see some of those slides that he showed again and again and again that explained the, the white crown of Egypt and the rest of these uh, things that he showed us all from mythology all from thousands of years ago. These things clearly were seen by civilizations that never talked to each other from the far corners of the earth. It all just clicked together like a, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle in my mind. A breakthrough for me came when I realized that many different cultures spread around the world use different words, different symbols, different myths to describe precisely the same formations in the sky. The Ouroboros, or celestial serpent biting its tail, for example, occurs on every habitable continent, but it has no ties to the world we now observe. Like all of the archetypes, it is part of an alien sky. A cosmic column rising to the center of the sky, holding aloft the wheel of heaven and much more than a wheel because this was the revolving cosmic temple, the city of the gods, the kingdom of heaven, always resting on the cosmic column. Then there's the image of the four rivers or pathways radiating from the center of the sky out to the boundary, the rim of the wheel. The simplest forms lead you invariably to the full story of world mythology. The hero's journey unfolds as the story of the wheel's axle. The mother goddess finds her identity in the star at the summit, the hub and spokes of the wheel. Every single time we think we've got it all figured out, we realize we've merely found another piece of the picture. It is a big picture. With then it was round, and it circled the sun. 
It was no longer the center of the universe. It was a tiny part of the Milky Way. With many pieces. Sir Isaac Newton was the first to state the law of gravity. Eventually, everybody agreed that gravity alone formed galaxies and stars and planets, and that gravity al The Milky Way was the only galaxy. Except it wasn't. It was only one of billions of galaxies floating in space without end. was once the center of the universe. It was flat, 